So now to the topic of the hour. When people from other states know you as that spinach guy, you've probably got something figured out. So without further ado, uh, let's give a warm remote welcome to Bill Warner. Take it away, Bill. Do I have to make my own clapping and noise? You um, do, yeah. Hi, yeah. everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in. This is, uh, I started with this slide because this is, uh, this year's one of my hoop houses. Um, this is probably the most used hoop house this year. Um, we always have big Thanksgivings and Christmas, although we even scale them down. But with this hoop house, we're bringing in fresh air and we keep the heater going and bring in fresh air so we can, you can see our tables distanced and um, we just use this hoop house and it's also the employee break room that used to be our kitchen. And of course, something slightly more important. My daughter works in a hospital in a birthing center. She's probably uh, gets COVID patients once or twice a week, but we always watch Packer games together. So we can do that here in the hoop house. Um, we just sit socially distanced and bring in fresh air and bring in the heat as we need it. But that's not why you guys are here. Um, but I was my good segue to Aaron Rodgers there, who is the person on the right, quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. And um, the guy on the left is a chef that I sell to a lot. And Aaron was in town to watch basketball. This is Andy North, who is a professional golfer and I'm assuming his partner. And they went to Tori's restaurant to eat. And of course, Tori's a big Packer fan. And I saw this on a website the next morning. I'm like, Tori, I assume you um, gave Aaron some of our spinach. And he said, of course. And what had happened is Aaron ordered a burger, but Tori wanted to impress him with extra food. And so he sent him our spinach. So um, this was probably in January or so. And it feels pretty cool when your food is used to impress somebody's idol. So by a major chef who, I think he's he's been nominated for National James Beard Award. Um, I don't know if he's won it, but he's won Midwest and he's won Iron Chef. But anyway, um, so I, it used to be season extension workshops, but now um, I look at it as winter's its own season and you have to attack it that way. You're not extending fall, you're not extending spring. Um, you're growing stuff in the winter and it's completely different. Um, and this slide here really, well, you can tell I took a long time on it, but um, it's, it's kind of a, I like to put the story of our food system in here. I've been telling people recently that I really like our food system. They can really ruin every food we have. And so as farmers, all we have to do is grow it and sell it as it's meant to be eaten. And in the winter, if you're growing stuff in a hoop house, it makes it even better. And the de degree of what you make it better is by all the different techniques you use. And so um, this area here, uh, and you can put in, instead of spinach, we used to only grow just spinach. Uh, but now because of spinach downy mildew being a disease from California that can wipe out a crop really quickly. We had a couple issues with it. It's now in the Midwest. We had to uh, scale back on, we only grow about half an acre of spinach in the hoops in the winter and we have about an acre. And we now grow collard, kale, chard, um, carrots, um, bok choy, tatsoi, I'm probably missing things, turnips. And what the cold does is makes everything sweeter. So um, here, this is probably, you know, mid-October to late April, your spinach is considered really good uh, or any of those crops. And then this is probably November through mid-April then. And really the spinach is so sweet. Kids, will, you know, I just sample it at market. Well, when we had market, I sample it at market and kids just eat it. And parents about five minutes later come back and go, what'd you do? You know, kids and kids eating spinach. I've done the same with carrots. And one woman was upset with me because then the kid loved carrots so much and she had to come back and buy them. And I don't think that was her intent. But so if you do everything right, remember we're already probably have better food than the food system just by growing it and selling it right. But then you add on the winter. This is too good to be called spinach in, I would say this is November through March. And then up here, it took us a little while between my wife and I to figure out which where exceptional and phenomenal went if we had them in the right direction. But um, this is December, January, February, and March here. And if you treat everything right, how you grow it, the techniques you use, um, it's, it's just amazing. And I would like to say it's all the way I do it, but it's more just by growing in the hoop and what you do 
And this is January and February. If you get all the cold right, all the warm right, uh, you have carrots that we just can't grow enough of. And it's just, every, it happens for everything. And so when you're selling, I mean, my unspoken motto is to, to, is to have the best and charge the most. Um, you know, that's kind of the American way. And um, I sometimes tell that to my customers and ask them how I'm doing. And they think I'm doing pretty good on both accounts. Um, you know, our spinach right now is going for $14 a pound and our carrots, there's like five or six in a bunch and it's $4 a bunch. Um, so we're getting pretty good price. And it's just cause we're not, we really have no competition out there. It's just all, you know, we're the only one with something really local. So what you're gonna see me spend a lot of time on, it's not necessarily what you grow, but it's how you grow it. And so you'll be seeing a lot of those techniques and in the past, um, I, I kind of wanted to uh, change my title to how to grow the second best food ever, because my way will help you grow the best, but it's very hands on. It's very someone needs to be at the farm. You know, ideally, some some of you, well, most of you are probably younger than me. So someone young can take my system, which is very low tech, but it's something that has grown over the 30 years into what it is and make it maybe so you can leave the farm for extended times right now right now we need someone on the farm we don't know if we have to do something every day but depending on the weather you might have to but that's the way you can get phenomenal um, anyway wrong way so this is this is uh, most of our hoops down in a valley it's perfect setup these are running hey, east Bill, west there you go oh. you're good did i okay this is running east west um, and these are tipped slight, all the hoops are tipped slightly to the south, which is ideal. And these on your right um, are tipped slightly to the east, which makes them really warm. That morning sun is a lot more valuable than the afternoon sun. And so here's this, this is the, to the left is, is the east. So these get the morning sun early and they warm up really well. All right, so here, this is late August, early September. Um, this is when we were just doing spinach. Spinach does not like to germinate in the heat. That's why we have the shade cloth on. We'd probably have it on anyway, but we leave it on for a couple of weeks before we plant. We do the same. We put silo bags on. In fact, if it's a hot August, working under a silo bag in there is a lot cooler. Um, but we're making our beds here. Um, and the I'm assuming your left and right is the same as mine on the screen. So this bed here, this is my left is um, you want them curved like this. You don't want them to hold the water from sprinkling or drip tape. And you don't want this, especially if you're planting the row crops like carrots, beets, radishes, spinach, because then this this will be a little more moist in here and you'll get more yellowing of your crops, your beet tops, your carrot tops, your spinach will turn yellow. So this kind of helps the water not puddle in the middle here. Um, and actually, this slide looks simple, but I, I messed it up the first time, so I had to do this one twice. Okay, this is um, this is right around Halloween, um, and part of this winter growing is you want everything to grow as slow and cool as possible, um, because that's why you see no end wall in the back; it's still open. We. We built a lot of these hoop houses before sidewalls were a big thing and good they weren't because this is these are curved out they're not straight so any uh, water would be dripping on the inside anyway um, so we put on plastic on the inside and the outside in the fall um, but like i said this is october we're trying to grow this spinach as slow as possible i liken it to when my sister comes up from florida she freezes at 50 and she can't handle it and we want our spinach to be able to go down, you know, last through January and February. So you don't want it used to the heat. Um, it grows too fast. The edges get a little too tender and it, you'll get some damage. Um, and this is, this is kind of perfect size. You can see there's really not ground showing. Um, it's close to getting too crowded, but we'll start thinning it out at, soon after that. Although this picture is about 15 years old or better. Um, so now on to winter. Uh, beautiful Southern Hill driveway there. Um, this was in the early 90s. I was already trying to retain heat. 
um, have no idea where I got all the milk jugs from. And, um, and I'm assuming I had put row cover over these at night, although I don't see any, but I would absorb the heat um, even back then. And these hoop houses were old. Uh, I just built them out of 40 foot reinforcement rod. Um, and just, just uh, you just bend them over, make an arch, but that's why I needed supports in the middle. Um, and even back then I was doing, um, this was my greenhouse inside a hoop house. I take the jugs, I could put them in here. I could, and, and at night I could put my flats on here and cover it up with styrofoam. And, you know, it was a way to, I didn't have a way to heat the greenhouse at the time. So it was a way I keep my plants alive. Um, this is just a different shot of that outside. I kind of, when I went to bigger hoops in 95, I kind of missed the wood in the middle. It's kind of home, a home feeling. Um, then at some point we went to um, row cover and this is, this worked, but for me, it didn't really work well. We were getting to the size where we had to cut a certain amount every week. We couldn't necessarily wait uh, for stuff to thaw out. So I had to put a heater in here. I would never heat in the winter to grow, but we heat to thaw things out so we can work because we, we just need to keep on a production schedule. Um, and so when you put a heater in here, you're heating this whole hoop house. You're heating everything. Um, and, you know, heat's all going up. So it takes a lot to thaw out everything here. Um, so we started make, trying to make our own covers. Um, this one's kind of messy. Um, we just took, here's an inside shot. We took black water piping and put it on little rebar posts in the ground, but obviously they sag. And then we tried putting um, row cover over the beds besides. Um, and here, because it's sagging so much, you can see we have milk crates holding stuff up. Um, the row cover on the inside was too many layers and we had cut out too many, too much light. It took a long time for the spinach to thaw out because you figure the, all my hoops are one layer plastic. Then I have the second layer. And I think each layer of plastic is seven to eight percent light cut off if it's clean. Um, and then the row cover must be a little bit more light than that cut off. So you're cutting off a lot of light. And in the winter, light is much more important than temperature. Uh, light is what makes your plants grow. Um, it's just a lot more important factor by a lot. So we made these little bars to hold it up so we could work underneath because this is my stepdaughter and she, you know, that that water on the plastic is cold, gets everything wet and it was hard. So we made these things so we didn't have to take off the cover because you can see the heater back there so we can thaw things out to work. Um, and I'm not thawing out the whole hoop house. And so we tried to upgrade it to a different type system here that had drawbacks. We couldn't hold the plastic up. And this one seemed to work pretty good. Um, this is my wife, Judy. Is this kind of some of you are old enough for Tinker Toys? I mean, maybe they had Tinker Toys recently. I don't know. Um, Liz, did you have Tinker Toys? Um, no, my grandparents okay. had a set. So I wonder if maybe okay. there was something yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're way too young. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we built this all out of PVC, a lot of pieces, a lot of corners. Um, this hoop house happened to be not this one, this is the silo bag I was talking about working under in January. Inside it's just dark in, or in August, it's dark. The sun's not on you when it's like 80 or 90 out. Anyway, this house is not level. I have four houses up here and they'll come into play later. That just, it was the only place I had more to, room to build and uh, they're not level at all. Um, so we had a reporter coming out and doing a story and they were in this house and slowly over time they start slanting down the hill and we didn't know it and it actually collapsed while she was in there with my daughter doing a story for the paper fortunately they didn't write to they didn't write about the collapse um, this is the structure we use now it's a lot handier um, these are this is electric conduit um, they come in at the big box stores they come in 10 foot lengths there's half inch and three quarters inch um, and so we, um, these are cut in half and you put them in the ground. 
Um, but this is, I'll show more about those later. This is what it looks like now on the outside. So we're not heating any of this area at all. We're heating only area that's four feet up the ground. So my crew this year, we're starting at eight to get stuff done. And so, you know, like this morning we hit below zero. I'm, I'm, uh, I guess if you're from Iowa, I'm about the same, I guess it's latitude. Is that what goes across as the Cora? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know what you guys got for the morning temperature, but it was pretty cold. So here I can, it, I, it just takes so much less heat. Um, anyway, and at the end, you just hold on clips with plastic. And this is putting the structure together. Uh, this is two or three years ago. Um, this is actually early November. We're actually expecting two days after this, we're expecting our first zero or it was supposed to get down to zero or slightly below zero, which is rare for us at that time of year. Um, but here we're putting it together. Um, that This one is four foot tall. You can see kind of this is Tessa. She's she's an Iowa person for you folks there. She's from Decorah. Um, anyway, um, there's Ben pieces here and I'll show you that a little later and they slide together with these bigger pieces but this is four foot tall and you can see how it where it comes up and we have done some five foot tall um, now Paul and Sandy Arnold who are from New York and I off the top of my head I can't remember the name of their farm and I've given workshops with them they lay row cover as close as they can to the crop um, they figure it's like a blanket when you go to bed you want that close to you um, this system has worked well for me and it, I think it's more that I'm, I'm using more of my house to keep me warm than I am the blanket outside. Um, and I, this warms up faster and stays warm long, warms up faster in the morning than the roll cover. It stays warm longer late at night and it's a lot easier to work under. Um, the five footers now, I really like for, this is my, this is the chard here, collards here. This is winter boar kale over here. Uh, works good in this type of hoop house because usually when you're harvesting for your CSA or market, you're picking stuff from all over the hoop house in here. And um, it's just easier to have it high enough where you don't have to peel back the plastic in all the directions, put it back down. Where um, in this one, here's my carrots here. You'll see a shot later on where the plastic gets peeled back and you're in that same bed of carrots the, all day, you know, or spinach, you're in the same bed all day. So the shorter hoops aren't as bad because you just peel back the plastic. Hey, Bill, uh, question. If yeah. you go back to the slide yeah. where you're standing under the five foot uh, yeah. ones there, uh, looks like, is that a heater in the background? And when are you, when are you starting to heat things up to thaw for the day? Is it before... In the, um, in the early morning before your crew gets there? What's what's just sort of your timing? Well, that's my biggest heater. And I figured I was gonna be in this hoop house a lot. So if it's gonna be below zero, I probably, cause plants go through, uh, when you're thawing them out, they get really limp for a while and then they firm up. Um, and so if, if it's gonna be below zero, I'll probably try to keep it right around 30, 30, I mean, no exact science, but 30, 35 overnight just, and it really doesn't cost much. I have some heaters. I mean, uh, a gallon of propane is 90,000 BTUs. So this is like a 200,000 BTUs. So I can only burn two gallons an hour, which is pretty cheap if it's going full blast. I have some heaters that burn like one gallon an hour. So so it, it cost me two or three bucks maybe to keep in house thought overnight. If it's gonna be well below zero, I'll just turn it on the night before when I'm walking my dog and keep it on cool. Um, then I'll go in the morning and turn it up just a little bit. And also it'll depend on if the sun's gonna be out that day or if it's gonna be cloudy. Because if the sun's gonna be out, then I wanna keep it cool because then all of a sudden you're worried about it getting too warm. And I think what I didn't say earlier is, um, whoever asked this question, thank you, um, is that most for all but about five or six weeks and today as I, i'm looking out my window is you're mostly worried about it being too warm you said i put the end walls don't put the end walls on until november um you just heat is your number one enemy um 
heat heat steals the sweetness. This is where you're shooting for exceptional, phenomenal. Heat steals the sweetness. Heat steals a lot of that. And so what you want to do is, you know, I'll get to it later where you kind of open it up and let heat, heat escape. But so if it's going to be sunny, I probably won't turn that heater up. If it's going to be cloudy, I'll turn it up 10 or 15 degrees so that it's comfortable for employees to work or myself. I, you know, it's cold hands are just not fun to work with. And so we try to keep it comfortable for people in there. Um, so I lost my train of thought. So that's much better than this pro cover by far. Um, so here's what I was describing earlier in here. We're, this shot was just actually taken about a week and a half ago. We're, we're, we've harvested one row of carrots out of here. And, you know, so I don't need to walk all over the place under the hoop house. We just peel it back. You can tell it's in the 30s out, maybe sunny because you can see it's open there to let air come in. We don't want it too warm. Um, so this is, this is just the carrots and we're still harvesting carrots. Um, this is my pipe bender for putting together that uh, I call them substructures. And it is real easy. Usually if, if we're all in a sitting in a room, I'd have someone come up, raise their hand and just show you how easy it is to bend the pipe. Um, it's just, you just put it on there. This again, you get, it's usually sitting in the store right next to the pipe and it's probably 30 or 40 bucks and it's real handy. So what you do is you, this is the three quarter electric conduit and they come in 10 foot lengths. So I cut it in half. Um, pounded about a foot in the ground. And so the half inch one is the one you bend. Um, this is probably a little long here because I got to span about 26 feet. My hoop's 30 wide, but the structure on the inside is about 26 feet wide because you need a little room to walk down the side. And so the half inch fits perfectly in there. And then you can see what Tess is doing here is this is a 10 foot. This is the bigger one again because it can slide into the it can slide into this one. And then you just put these together. You can see they're pushing them together now here. And then that gives me, um, I have about 28 feet, 28 feet of pipe to cover 30 feet or 26 feet. So it works pretty well. Sorry, Anna, if I'm saying the numbers too fast. Um, text Liz if I am and she can tell me. Anyway, um, for those that, Anna's our interpreter. Um, anyway, so, um, we just have this structure together. Uh, here's just a different angle of it. This is some of my old PVC. I've got tons of this, what I call Tinker Toys. I got tons of these PVCs around in different sizes. This just keeps it supported really well. I'd kind of learned this structure from John Birnbaum from Michigan State, but he used a Y here and, to hold it. And I just improved it slightly by using the PVC. It's, it just holds it up. Uh, really well. And there's the heater in the back again. Like I said, you don't heat to grow. You could never pay for it, but for with the crops I'm growing, but it definitely to keep working, we need it. And Bill, what temperature uh, do you consider comfortable working temperature? Uh, it depends if it's, if it's cloudy. I really don't care how warm they, how warm it is. I mean, I try to do less cutting spinach, um, you know, hands and knees work. I'm in my sixties, you know, I played rugby too much and um, I'm trying to do less of that. Uh, but I just want them to be comfortable and want them to not mind coming to work and cutting or harvesting. Uh, so if it's cloudy, you know, I just tell them you you can only burn about a buck 50 an hour on my, most of my heaters or two bucks an hour, be comfortable. I mean, it's, 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 you know, I think of it as a minor expense to keep the employees more comfortable. Awesome. Um, if we're in the, if we're in there for a long time, then, you know, that's great. Um, short time. What we'd also have now, what, what can be a problem is if it's sunny, it'll warm up, but too much. And then the crop will start wilting and start dehydrating. So we have shade cloth, old shade cloth that we can put over the substructure on the inside. And so when it's sunny, they work the beds from North to South. And when it's cloudy, we start south to north because that that's otherwise the sun, because with the sun being so low, I wish I could uh, describe this better, but with the sun being so low that the substructure plastic will, will still cover, will still shade some of the beds you're working in if you work north to south. 
I'll have to um, remind me, Liz, when we get to the slide where this, I'll go backwards. There we go. So this is south to your, to your right. If you can see here, this is a sunny day. This bed of carrots is a lot darker. It's still being shaded by this substructure. So when it's, when it's sunny, you can kind of work in the bed that's open and then you would peel it back further. Um, carrots, we're not worried about wilting in the sun, but if this was spinach or kale or whatever, it slowly dehydrates and gets, gets limper in the sun and it's just not quite as, quite as good. So you can see that that's a little darker than this one. And Bill, um, do you use uh, silage plastic? And if so, where do you, um, in what form do you get it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, I call it silo bag, but silo plastic is probably the correct term. I usually don't use correct terms for most things. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, we have farm and fleet, but I'm, I know there's fleet farms or, you know, any agricultural store. It's 50 foot wide. Um, yeah, it, it is, it is, we use that more now, more for where we're going to plant spinach than shade cloth. Um, the, when you plant spinach, it doesn't like like I said, it doesn't like to germinate and the direct sun is actually more damaging than the heat. Um, so the shade cloth does a good, uh, helps it a lot, but the silo bag really, um, it takes a day longer to germinate in the silo bag than it does in the shade cloth, but you do have to be quicker at getting it out because there's no light. That spinach that's popping up will start reaching for light really quick. Where the shade cloth, you have an extra day or so to take it off because it, it's you're still getting more light. And the silo bag, if it's on a weekend and I'm the only one to take it off, it's a lot more difficult to take off because often there'll be some sweating between the layers and wet plastic on wet plastic is not an easy one to take off. Yeah. So I do try to time my planting of spinach there. It's usually four to five days of germination. And Bill, I, I haven't looked so thoroughly through your photos to know um, that there are some questions coming about uh, watering and aphids. So just to put that in your head for as you're moving forward. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, here, all right. I'll try to remember that right after when we get more to the crops. You would think this would be more about crops, but like I said, it's more on what you do. This substructure works good. At the ends, you need more strength than those posts give you. So we pound in T posts. Um, I'm assuming these are the five footers because then you pound them in there four feet. And you want to pound it so that blade is in the ground so you don't step on it, hit stuff on it. And then I use more of the PVC at the end because I have the pieces and it fits over the T-post pretty well. Uh, so um, let's see, I'll, I'll go over the watering real quick. Um, and it's more, um, the bigger crops when we get the kale, collard and chard, I have a tendency to use drip tape uh, the row crops like spinach, um, well, I actually, I use sprinklers for most everything. Uh, I do have a kale cow and charred house, which I have elevated some of my sprinklers all about a foot to 12 inches off, or a foot to 12 inches, that was good, about a foot to 15 inches off the ground. Um, and so I, the drip tape, I had a tendency to overwater, water too hard. Uh, sprinklers have their pros and cons. Um, I was doing a workshop with Elliot Coleman and uh, oh, Alan, I can't remember his first name from Milwaukee. Uh, anyway, Will Allen. And uh, of course, Elliot was the main person and my wife and I and Will Allen were more panelists. But um, he thought the sprinkling is the natural rinsing like the rain would do of the nitrates down in the soil. And that's what draws the aphids. So by sprinkling, we have had less aphid problem. And so I had switched to a lot of sprinklers. Otherwise it was drip tape before that. Um, so I, I do, it does seem to make a difference. I do use sprinklers and he thought a lot of rinsing versus heavy sprinkling. Now you don't, when you're hauling hoses around, uh, we have 13 hoop houses. I said about an acre of hoops. So that's, a, it's, the winter is the hardest time. It's the dirtiest, it's the muddiest, hardest time to water. You don't need to water as much, but um, it, it, that is, it is a lot more difficult to do sprinkling in December through February than the drip tape. Um, but like I said, I used the drip tape more. You'll see it more when we get to the collard and kale and chard. Anyway, um, the heating and cool maintenance. This is where 
you can make the difference from it being too good to be called whatever the crop is to exceptional and phenomenal. Um, it's all, and this is where, like I said, we need to find you younger, smarter people. Um, need, we need to find ways to make this maybe more automatic. I just have never been, I grew into this system over 30 years. Um, and like I said, it's like today, I probably should be out right now opening those up. Um, it's probably getting slightly too warm, but I have this six week window that I mentioned where it's, uh, you're more worried about it being too cold and that's from mid December to late January. And so getting, not opening up and venting out heat is less critical right now than it will be in a week or two. Um, but yesterday morning or yesterday our high was 17. Uh, we were in the teens, we were in the single digits overnight and I had, we had to vent by 10 o'clock. So I keep looking, if I turn my head, I'm looking for clouds to roll in. So stuff's hoping they're supposed to roll in today. So we were venting um, and, you know, my employees say, when do we vent? I said, well, if you open it up, open up that, that substructure and you go, whoo, that's too warm, then that's too warm. If it doesn't blow you away with heat, then you're okay. Um, so here is, um, this is, this is the winter. I really learned how much more important light was than temperature. Um, our normal snowfall is 50 inches. The record was 75 and this was the winter we hit hundred. Um, and so I had trouble getting light in there. It was snowing, seemed like an inch or two or an inch or dusting every day. We had some big snowfalls, but it was more just seemed to be a dusting. And really, you know, this is the south side of a hoop. There's, there's no sun going in there. Um, so I actually had to climb up. I'm probably my feet are, the bottom of my feet are probably about five feet off the ground. Um, but I'm just on a snow bank and I was clearing it off. And then now this snow will eventually heat up and slide down. Um, and this winter, while our hoops were more insulated, I mean, there's no air coming in and out of these things. The ground is not frozen outside of it. Um, usually stuff starts growing again late January, early February. It took an extra month this year just because at some point, this was about all the light that was coming in on most days. Um, and so it just wasn't getting the light it needed to grow. Um, and this is a chart, this is probably three years ago. Um, when I'm, this is not the snow you just saw, but we're, we're looking at a light snow on Sunday and a low of two, all right? And Monday is gonna be sunny in, in, in 19. And so I certainly leave the snow on, you know, if it was going to be below zero this day, I'd probably leave the snow on and it would probably stay thawed out in my hoop houses. Um, or if I turned on my heater for an hour, say, it would thaw it out. And I, I really don't, I rarely go and take, try to remove snow. Um, once in a while, like in this case where I do want it to warm up in there, I will go and remove snow. Otherwise, I've it's just, I used to religiously go remove snow, remove snow, remove snow, but it, it's a good insulator and it usually gets cold after it snows. So I usually leave it on. Eventually the sun will, sun will take it down for me. Um, anyway, so, you know, here we're gonna hit 19 and it's getting cold again. So I do want it to heat up in there. And this is what it looks like before we knock off a light snow. Um, you can see it's how dark it is in here on the plastic. Uh, just take a little, broom and you just go tap it. You just tap it. Boom, 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 boom. I just walk down the side and just tap each section here, you know, boom, 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 and just keep tapping it. It just falls. Uh, Cause if it's that cold, it's not adhering as a moist snow would. And now, now look at the inside there. Um, again, there's that to that. And now you're getting some light here. Okay. You're getting some light here and eventually that'll start heating up. And you can see a crack in the snow line here from me tapping earlier. That'll start sliding down. So then the light will eventually make it to the back. So these north beds are definitely slower growing because they, they have the lower light. And when it snows, they get the last light. Um, so, um, so the tapping is, that's all I need to do. I don't have to spend much time trying to clear the whole thing. The sun will do it for me. Um, again, there's that shot, okay. The other way I, I use to vent heat and cool is I just have this little corner open. This must be a cold day yet. And uh, you can see, you just need to vent a little bit. Here's a shot from the inside. Um, 
and it's just so I have for venting I have my end walls I have my substructure here's my substructures open this must be a pretty warm day I rarely open this this is the south edge I rarely open it and here's my sprinkler system you can see um, for watering but I rarely open this because then the sun hits this and I really like I said watering is a total pain in the but I guess I better say, but um, it's total pain. And if you open this and the sun's only hitting this, this stuff stays a lot more moist and this gets dry. And so now you've got to drag in hoses and, and drain hoses and hope your hydrant's not freezing up and do all that more often. So I rarely open up the south side, but here, this is the west. This is the north side open. And you can see where the closest to us is the east side and that's open. And, you know, it is nice and cool in there. It's not getting too hot. Um, so here's just a different shot. This is the south side here. And you can tell I, I got this side down. Um, I'll get a different shot of that later. Okay, so here is the end wall. Here's the substructure. Um, I tell you, when you have 13 hoops, that's 26 ends. And when you have plastic on the outside and the inside of each end, opening end walls is a total pain. Um, I'm getting to where my shoulders and neck get really sore doing this. But it, like I said, it's just kind of something that developed. Um, but we have, if it's gonna be maybe only 20 is the low overnight, I'll leave the end walls open so I don't have to mess with that and I'll close, close my substructure ends. And then once it warms up, I can just lift these and I don't have to go through, what is it, what's 13 times four? You know, 52 end walls. Um, the reason I have two end walls on each end is one on the inside of these two by fours and one on the outside is the one on the inside, if the wind stops the wind that's coming in the other end. And so they don't, the ends don't blow. If you don't have that inside one, you have your outside end walls just blowing open with the wind all the time. So this keeps them, when you want, don't want the wind in, having two end walls at each end keeps the wind from blowing. Anyway. Hey, Bill, uh, there's a question yep. about the substructure um, and how are yeah. you holding up the plastic? How are you holding plastic up when you're rolling it up on a substructure? Oh, if I'm gonna open this end, you mean? We'll see, we'll see if he can clarify that in the chat for us. Okay. Um, but I think um, maybe, this, yeah. I just flip this up. I just flip up this end and lay it on on top here. And when I'm rolling up the sides, I just flip it up and lay it on the end. Um, so that's where if we go back to this photo, which would probably be the one you're talking about here, is uh, you can see this is just flipped up and laid on top there. This is flipped up, laid on top there. Um, so it's just, I only pull the plastic back and forth if we're working. I used to push it all the way back to try to get as much sunlight as possible. And it would probably give me slightly better crop, but boy, that's just a lot of work. Um, while I am low tech, I am trying to be a little, not trying to get every maximum thing I can because that takes more and more work. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of, but so here, I, I'll just flip this end up. I don't have to open the end walls. Um, here is, you can use this as a t different temperature monitor. You can see I got quite a bit open here. Uh, we have a complicated system. We call it four nail system. We have four boards across the front and we tell people to open one nail, two nails or four nails and by how much air you want flowing through. So you're kind of, you're the bottleneck here. You can choke off a uh, day like today and yesterday where it's gonna, you know, we're gonna open it at 10 and we're gonna close them at two. Um, we'll often do one nail cause we just don't want it hitting 70, 80 in there. Um, we don't want it, you know, we wanna keep it in the sixties if we can we do want it. We do want it to warm up because you know, like I said, it was four below zero this morning here. So, but it was pretty warm. This whatever day this was, I don't know what the temperature was. So we got the inside up. We got this is the top. So air is coming. This is on an uphill slope. So air is coming out this end. Um, if this was a bottom, we'd probably take this piece and air is flowing in it, we'd probably close this so the air is not going directly onto the spinach there. But we'd still be getting heat loss going out the sides. Um, hopefully that's making sense. Usually people can get back at me quicker when I'm not making sense to an answer. But um, 
So you're just doing different things to try to, here, we don't want a lot of air coming out and I didn't want air going in and hitting my spinach here. So I one put one nail opening here and I kind of off center where this is open here. So you don't have that direct breeze blowing on this. Um, okay, and back to these are the houses that I had that are sloped. Um, it's, this, this is a pretty, pretty big slope. When the power company came out to hook up the power, they said, this box has to be level. And I said, <laughs> put your level on it. And, and he couldn't believe it was level, you know, cause that hoop is just, that's, that's put it this way. When I put, as soon as I put the hoop on this much of a slant, the warranty was void. Um, but it was the only place I had to put them on. But this goes back to different parts of your hoops are going to have different temperature zones um, and you, you need to kind of know them. Um, again, this was two years later. Uh, you can see on, on, this, on the 13th of February, it was gonna, it's going to hit 10 below. Um, and on the next day, the high is going to be 16. And that high is roughly about four o'clock here. Okay, that's just something to keep in mind in the next couple slides. I was doing temperature checks. I had a, if we go back to this shot, I had a, in the inside, I had a temperature about this high up, uh, a reader about a foot off the ground that would read the temperature every half hour. And I had one about this high up, same read the same every half hour, um, just to see what the difference was in there. Uh, Cause this, in the winter down here, I get a lot of damage on spinach and stuff like that. and. Um, so anyway, um, here's the readout of the chart here down here is the 13th that bottom when it hit 10 below hit seven degrees. Uh, now this next chart is going to be the top one and what you what I want you to notice it's oh no it's my numbers okay seven degrees. All right, and that's at 630 in the morning if you notice you know it was cool that night before at midnight we're at like 12 degrees, but you will notice how quickly things warm up. I mean, remember it's starting at still below zero, probably at 930. Um, here we're opening up at 10, it's probably four or five degrees. You can tell we opened up here because all of a sudden the heat quit going up as fast. It stayed in the 50s. So we're venting it out and that's the bottom where it's cooler staying in the 50s. And Bill, uh, so, this, uh, so this is a yeah. thermometer that's capturing the data for you. Are you monitoring yes. this in real time? And do you have these in all of your uh, hoop houses or, or just in a couple? Uh, this is something called a uh, log tag. And I just hang them there and like two months later, you go back and plug them into your little thing that they plugs into the computer and it prints out charts as however you want them. Um, I would probably could have better looking charts if I knew more how to handle it. That's but, fine. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, this red means I grabbed it. You know, these are all different, you know, reading times. So I you, mm -hmm. you can put it in there and forget about it until you want it. And then you can cut out, you can make the charts wherever you want. So it's called log tag. But um, anyway, so. And, and Bill, just the, let you know, you've got about 15 minutes left. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. I better keep rolling then. Anyway, so this is the top. You notice it's 10 degrees warmer up top. At night, it was 10 degrees warmer. And look at now, again, it's 10 o'clock. We've opened it up and look at, we're hitting 70 at like noon. Uh, well, at about 1230. And remember, it's probably about 10 degrees outside. So in February, as that strong get, sun gets stronger, you got to open up a lot quicker. Um, and this was one I just left when I didn't have any crops and we did get minus four in there. So um, again, here we have, this is the coldest spot on these houses down below. And you can see on the end here, these crops are a lot smaller. The ends are usually a little bit smaller, but this is substantially smaller just because it doesn't get that morning sunlight to warm it up. Um, so I want to go through then, I'll, I'll skip a little bit of this, but we'll get to the crops, okay? This is uh, 925, this is my second planting of um, pot soy, this is my first, and there's bok choy. And about three weeks later, this is that same, this is that first planting, this is the second planting of tot soy, this is the bok choy, we're already harvesting it, but notice the end walls are still off, we want it cool. Here's my carrots, full size. So Bill, um, you'll need to slow down just a little bit if you want to show us the pictures because there's a tiny bit of lag when you're clicking oh, and what we're seeing. Got it, got it, okay. So, so anyway, now, we're seeing, we're now we're seeing carrots. Just really? Well, we're seeing. 
uh, oh. four beds. So now we're seeing, I think, a tatsoi with a purple. Um, and a bok choy, yes. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna turn my picture. I wanna know how much leg I have. I'm turning it now. And now. Oh, wow. Sorry, guys, this is probably, is... okay. Here's the carrots. Um, all right, then I'm gonna, I'll just skip to a few. I'll give you a second here. This is um, beginning of November. We're getting ready for that below zero building. These, this down here is where, um, this is where I, my goal is to get this harvested out before it gets damaged. Just those cold part of those cold hoops. Um, I'm gonna skip that section. Uh, sorry. Okay. This is my um, kale collard and chart. Oh, I'll wait. Let you guys catch up. All right. This is the 25th of September. This is the house that I have my kale, my collards, my chart in. Um, here's some lacinato, some red Russian. Here is um, Swiss chard. And are you getting in my time in this right now, Liz? Yep. You're about good. Okay, and this is my winter bore. Okay, this is the 25th of September. This stuff was put in the ground probably around the 5th or 6th. Um, okay, again, here's another shot of that. I'm probably just getting it. I'm flipping through a couple of these here. Okay, three weeks late. Oh, one, two, three, four picture. Okay, three weeks later. Did I time that, Liz? Uh, this is just three weeks later, uh, the 18th of October. Um, you can see that I do have the drip tape in there. Um, the, the chard is filling in good. The collards are here. Um, and everything's filling in. And just right about now, you should be seeing a shot of my winter bore. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't I really don't like to show ground going into November. I mean, I think you saw that in like my fifth shot, which was the spinach was a solid bed. Um, and when do you set up the structures for this? Uh, well, that that other year that or this the year that we're talking about, because we're going to get below zero in September or in November, we set it up boom we called in people and we set it up quick to get the plastic on uh because you, you want it to you don't want to go from it's low of 20 to low of zero the plants you know at least i probably saved a few degrees and it warmed up quicker mm -hmm. um and so this year we started building them as we had time just so we were more ready i mean once you put up the structure it's a little harder it's more when you put the plastic in that's you don't want that too early because you are starting to cut sunlight so we mm -hmm. try to put the plastic in like the last moment, which is, so we scramble because it's kind of a pain. But uh, so we, um, so anyway, this is the 18th. I'm gonna skip ahead. All right. This is now that day we sh we're building all this. Oh, wait, one, two, three, got it now. Okay, this is the day we are building all those structures. Um, we're gonna put the plastic on the next day and the day after that is when it's gonna hit zero. But this is uh, November 7th. This year I planted everything a week later and it's not nearly this size as I wanted at the beginning of November, but that, that Swiss chart right there. Um, and I got 200 probably plants in that bed. And, and I pick four or five of those leaves and sell it for four bucks. Um, same with the collards, same with the winter bore. There's the size of my collards. Uh, some people think I look better, oh, wait, delay. Some people think I look a little better wearing a collar like that. Um, oh boy, I know what's coming. <laughs> oh, oh no, no, not I mean... what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm trying to try. I'll try um, anyway. So there's with the collars. That's good size collars. Um, we probably this year we're picking them a little smaller. But again, we are you know. If you're on the right side of a monopoly, they can be fine. Um, and you know, we're the only ones selling collards and kale and chard right now. Uh, there's the winter boar kale. Again, this row has 
Well, the 15, there's probably 250 plants in this row. And, you know, I'm going to get two bunches off a plant and we're selling for $4 a bunch. So that's pretty good. And Bill, are you um, just kind of banking these up or do you take multiple cuttings off of any of these or just single? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, oh no, we do. Um, well, here is, I'm going to, okay. Here's the collards on January. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Here's the collards. We're just taking the big leaves. Um, you know, with the spinach, with, with all of our, well, not carrots or stuff like that, but with the collards, kale, chard, we just keep picking the biggest leaves. Um, and here, here's that patch on the 10th of uh, January that we've harvested quite a bit, but you can see we still have a lot to go. Um, and in a second, I just showed again what it looked like two months before that. Um, Are you, do you do any like baby cuttings that you want to regrow or is it mostly full size cuttings? Oh no, no baby. Um, people ask me why I don't do baby spinach. It's just, it would take forever to cut. I mean, if I'm charging, you know, as the winter goes on, our leaves get smaller and it just takes longer. You got to put a couple more in a bunch. So if I'm cutting baby, I feel like I'm just losing money. Um, mm -hmm. And so here, I think you probably have a picture of the chard coming up and here, you know, now we can see ground. So the ground's going to start absorbing that heat. And this house, like I said, was earlier than I have another one that was planted later. This house was earlier. And so you want, you want some of that ground heat, um, especially in January. Uh, there, well, in a minute, you'll, I'll wait. Here's the winter bore. And if this is kind of goes back to that question you asked Liz um, is on these plants, it looks like I've taken off and a couple of these are probably bottom yellow leaves, but I've probably taken off five or six leaves on each plant already. So that's at least one bunch per plant. And this is January and I'm going to harvest, I harvested off of these plants uh, basically through April at least, maybe into May. So, um, so you no, know, we just take the bigger ones. When we have time, we go through and try to clean up below hand, get the junk out of there. Again, that was a, what it looked like. A couple questions Pardon for you this? while we're waiting. I have a couple yeah. questions while we're. So for spinach yeah. cutting, do you cut larger outside leaves or clean cut? Uh, well, we have three different cuts. Um, and we try to do large leaf because again, you get the most, you're, you're cutting spinach when it's the biggest and it's quicker. Um, and, but depending on, and I know you've probably seen some of the chickweed that was in some of the earlier photos, uh, chickweed can take over. At that point, we cut really heavy. So we can go through and the technical term we use is degunk it. We'll just go through and claw everything out with our hands um, just because otherwise you're gonna lose the spinach to chickweed. I mean, I've said for years, if I was really brilliant, I would have figured out a way to market chickweed and a lot of it because then I wouldn't have to weed, I wouldn't have to plant. All I'd have to do is water and harvest because mm -hmm. um, chickweed will eventually take over every hoop house. But I, if I had a longer workshop here, Liz, you're gonna have to have me back next year. <laughs> okay. um, I would, we solarize. And if you saw the shots, the house hoop houses with the carrots, the hoop houses with, uh, I can't speed back. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead. You're gonna see a lot of flashing. Okay, um, and we do this, we solarize uh, about a quarter of our houses each year. This year I didn't get enough done. Uh, weeding chickweed out of spinach costs a lot of money. Um, here you can look at, I got a hoop house with my carrots and my turnips and my other stuff at the bottom. Do you have that one yet, Liz? Yes. Okay, that house, we probably spent less than five hours weeding that house. Um, and there's not really much of a weed in there. Um, when I solarize, I shut down. And again, this goes to why you want to think of it as winter, winter growing instead of extending seasons. We try to, we can make beds by late May, early June. I want to move it up to mid to late May. You make our beds, water the heck out of it, keep the end walls on, lath them down, throw a sheet of plastic on the ground and leave it for two months. Now, when we come back and take that off in, in August, we then um, 
we then we buy truckloads of compost and we just wheelbarrow it in and try to put an inch deep on all of that. Um, and then the hardest part is with my carrots here is I have probably fried most of my organic matter, even though I'm adding compost. But, you know, I, instead of spending hours and hours, whoever's weeded chickweed knows it's hours and hours of weeded chickweed and it keeps coming back. Now, I, I won't have chickweed in this house on most of the areas for about a year and a half. So I can come in with my carrots and plant and not have to weed carrots. And the not on these beds because they're shorter, but on ones where we've got planted right, the ones I showed earlier where I had the, the um, substructure peeled back, we're harvest, we got seven rows of carrots in a bed and we're harvesting somewhere between 80 and 100 row, a bunches of carrots per row. So that means we're getting six, 700 bunches of carrots out of a bed and we're selling those for $4 a bunch. So um, you do have, you know, and then now if I time it right, now when my carrots come out now, I can plant other row crop up. Don't often like to do this, but it's been solarized and compost. I can come in with my radishes now and not have to weed. I can come in with beets or I can, you know, I don't have to weed this spring, maybe a few hours. And then I can cover crop it in the summer to get, um, I'll put sorghum sudan in, it grows really fast, till that under. And then I can, now if I plant my spinach, I hardly have any weeds. I rarely have any chickweed problem. And this is in the second fall afterwards. And then theoretically, what I probably won't get to is that um, then the third year, the third winter you follow with the kale, collard and chard. Again, you'd grow another cover crop. You follow with the kale, collard and chard because um, when, when, they, when the plants start to fry out, those shoots, man, in April, when those shoots are coming out, that when they're going to seed, those are tender. They taste like a really sweet broccoli. Um, oh, here's, well, here's another of my carrots and what we've been doing. I'll get back to my shoots in a minute. The carrots, we're starting to put the tops back on the ground just because I know it's low and oh, I got to forget to wait. You got my carrots yet, go. Liz? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. We're, we're, we chop off the tops. We leave a little bit to show people they're fresh. Leave a couple inches of top for the rubber band to show people they're fresh. And now we're, we're dumping the tops back on because I know I'm a little bit low in organic matter. And so then now we'll till these tops in. This again, this shot was taken about 10 days ago, I think. Um, and so we'll till that in and I'll be able to start starting around um, Valentine's Day is when we start planting carrots again, radishes and beets will probably be more like uh, the beginning of March. We've always tried to time it for um, our first outdoor market, which, well, we used to have the largest market in the United States and I don't, it's just, it's a whole different market right now, but we do have websites we're selling through. And I have, because of the spinach disease we had a few years ago, I built, I had to cut people off on spinach or limit their order. And so I had, I went into the pandemic with 450 names on email list. So that's been very helpful. So, um, and, so now I'm glad there was spinach. Oh, I was just Go going ahead. to ask, um, I know that your outlets, market outlets are a little different this year, but typically are you doing a winter greens CSA and selling to restaurants primarily or what, who are your buyers for? Um, for your winter well, greens? because, because we went from, we cut the amount of spinach we did in half and it was pretty much spinach was all already sold. Um, we had to figure out, well, that's, we, so we went from spinach shares in the winter to, well, we're cutting you back instead of a pound, you're going to get three quarters of a pound because we can't take the chance with spinach downy mildew near, we can't put every, all our eggs in that basket. So that's why we started growing this other and they have to sign up then for, you know, it's still mostly spinach value wise, but then they get like this year, they're getting a root crop and a green with it every week. Mm -hmm. And um, that's winter CSA. And, and then you also have yeah. And restaurants. Then, but since we, no, we really don't do restaurants much anymore. Um, you know, like I said, we like to charge, you know, raise the best, charge the most. Um, and so our, our kind of our technical model with restaurants was if, if you can afford us, we can't afford you. Um, and um, so we've been cutting back on that. The winter market here in Madison has been really, really good. Um, and like I said, because of the cutting back on spinach, I went into the pandemic with 450 names. And so there's a website and a group of farmers here that are 
you know, I send, they send out the email from the orders every week, but I send out to my 450 people telling them what I have. And we're doing at least 80 to 90% of what we would at winter market. So, you know, okay. like I said, uh, I used to think downy mildew was a terrible thing, but it certainly has saved us. I mean, <laughs> you know, we had to change our model and we had to change and it happened. We just got lucky with how it happened. Mm. Um, I want to get back to kale shoots for a second because okay. we're about out of time, Liz. Yeah, technically we are at the end, but um, I'm okay. going to, we have 10 more minutes before the webinar cuts out. Um, okay, folks, you might want to finish about the shoot yeah. and then we'll do questions. Okay. Um, these are the kale shoots and obviously now with the food safety, these were not sold because they're on the ground, but I just wanted to show you that we, we do harvest them with the flowers. We make little bunches. We sell them, you know, we, we try to price everything the same. It just makes people can mix and match. We, we were at market four dollars or three for ten they could take carrots kale chard shoots you know just made it simpler uh, four dollars a bunch three for ten and it just and these shoots um, the reason I in my solarize solarizing rotation I do the kale collard and chard last is because I'm if I don't solarize this not only do I have chickweed but I've got beds I got all these kale collard chards because everything's gone to flowers while we're trying to sell shoots um, and then, then when I do, I work all that into the ground then when it's done, but you, your tiller won't work all that in when that stuff's going to seed, but let's go to questions. Okay. Um, so one is, uh, back to the, the harvesting you for spinach harvest, you have a large leaf only harvest, a clean cut weed and weed chickweed. And what's the third type of spinach harvest? Uh, Very nice. Third. <laughs> I, I like washing spinach. What can I say? Uh, again, the employees wanted me to do that. And I told them only if the spinach wasn't going to go to waste that we'd eat it or they'd eat it. So, um, the, well, we do them as winter goes on, all of a sudden my leaves aren't as big, but now as soon as February hits, I know stuff's going to take off. So we want to keep harvesting or we have to for our CSA or whatever. Um, let's go back to a different shot. Anyway. Um, so, um, if we, if we need to, if it's not chickweed, but we need to get out the yellow and the bottom leaves or the first leaves that come out are all flat and usually not very good, then we'll kind of do that medium cut where we can still go in and scrape all that stuff out, not damage. Here I'm doing, showing my hand on my pad, sorry. Um, you can, um, we can get a lot of that junk out, show ground again, as in the January, you wanna be showing ground in the spinach. It thaws out quicker, it absorbs the heat during the day. Um, like this, this bed of carrots that you're seeing now, it doesn't absorb much heat and it's going to take a while to thaw out. Uh, with the spinach, you want to get some of those leaves out of there. You're going to show the ground and it'll thaw out a little quicker in this, in this, in the winter. And do you have any issues with voles or other rodents in your tunnels? Oh yeah. In the... Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think we have more carrots than they can eat right now. And they usually take just a few bites off the top. And so that just becomes employee carrots, second carrots, giveaway carrots. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I probably, we also have a little bit of the edge row of carrots, probably from compaction of walking down the aisles. Um, we usually get some that are about half the size. Um, again, that goes, you know, one of our employees has twins that are two, three years old. They just love the carrot, you know, so it gives me carrots to give away. Uh, six rows, I probably, by those short ones throwing out that are on the side, usually not in the middle, I'm not losing or gaining. So I keep the seven rows just so I can keep giving carrots away, I guess. Okay. Um, and let's see, let's see. Um, what, what type of collards, what variety of collards are you using? Um, and for, I guess, generally for your other winter crops, are there varieties you particularly like? Uh, well, the collards, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm, doing i'm raising a couple crops for john navazio johnny's i got champion going and then he sent me another kind which i'm not sure the name of it yet um i really i don't think i've ever eaten a collard you know um i didn't know how to i didn't plant kale before two years ago or collards or chard um i've probably taken a bite of a collard just so i can say i've eaten it but actually people say you just saute it just cut it up saute it and you know, when people first told me just cook it with bacon, I'm like, why ruin bacon? Um, <laughs> you know, it's so 
but er everything we sell, people keep saying this is the best fill in the blank that I've ever had. You know, it's just the winter can do it. And so it's more, the more you can keep it from maxing out in heat, the more you can keep it temperate, just the better it is. Cause the heat, the heat will steal some of the sweetness. Um, varieties with spinach, as soon as I find one that works, I put about four or five years worth in the freezer because they have to keep changing varieties for downy mildew. So there's, you know, there's, you just have to, I always go with the most dark Savoy I can. And now I kind of look at some of the resistance numbers, but the most dark Savoy with the best resistance is what I go for on spinach. Can you buy your seed ahead and keep it in the freezer? Uh, for the spinach, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, it used, it used to be a lot of seed, you know, um, but now it's, it's getting less and spinach is becoming less important. The, the rest of this stuff is, you know, it's again, downy mildew is probably the best thing that happened to our farm for spinach, downy mildew, because really spinach is the hardest on all of our bodies. Uh, takes just not much quicker, doesn't really make much more money. Um, and when we're all 13 hoop houses spinach, four days a week, you're harvesting spinach for three or four hours. Where now we harvest spinach for three hours on a Monday and then we harvest the rest of our crops and pack stuff on a Tuesday and then we harvest for three or four hours on a Thursday so it it's you know bad stuff is bad until it's good you know and uh so we're lucky how things have turned out for us mm -hmm. we're, and you know and um back to the question about aphids did did going from the drip line to oh. the sprinklers solve your aphids issue or are you still um... ah nothing solves um <laughs> but uh, that's when we do a heavy degunk, I try to time that for, if we're going to have to spray, the soaps haven't really worked. Um, we usually go to Pyganic, which is certifiable organic. Um, you're not supposed to use it as first treatment, I don't think, but the, unless you know something doesn't work. Um, that's why we'll do the heavy degunking, cut heavy. If we got aphids, we'll cut really heavy and um, we will spray. Um, I'll go back to my tank here. Uh, you'll see in a minute, this is how we wash our spinach. It's basically a jacuzzi system in the bottom of an old bulk milk tank. And if there's minor amounts of aphids, this'll, this'll wash most of them off. Um, if there's a lot, then like I said, you gotta degunk heavy and, um, and then spray. Uh, we are gonna try wasp this year. We tried lady beetles before or ladybugs, but they have a tendency to leave really quick, but I've heard the wasps don't, so. Okay, and we might uh, end, and uh, this will shut off at some point automatically, so I wanna make sure, Bill, I say thank you to you and that we'll definitely have to have you back. This was a really great structural presentation and, inter and an introduction to the crops, and we'll have to have you back to do the, the crop planning and, and crop management, so.